Welcome to Corwin's Monday afternoon webinar series. I'm Nicole Franks, Executive Marketing Manager for Corwin. Today's presentation is on releasing leadership brilliance with authors Simon Bailey and Marcia Riley. Corwin believes that leadership can make an immediate and indelible impact on education. We value evidence-based, highly practical training and resources and demonstrate our expertise by bringing you smart authors discussing game-changing ideas that challenge us all to question long-standing assumptions and achieve our collective best in today's educational environment. Today's presenters will do just that for you. Simon and Marcita describe what separates good leaders from brilliant ones and share success stories from their model to help you overcome educational inertia to reach new heights of achievement. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Simon Bailey and Marcita Riley. Hi, Nicole. Thanks for Hi. introducing us. Yeah, thank you so much. Good to be with you guys today. So let me tell you a little bit about Simon's background. Um, Simon is, uh, he's from the business world, the business sector, and um, he's originally from Buffalo, New York, from the hood in Buffalo, New York. Um, he, he has spent most of his uh, career in um, working for Fortune 500 companies, and the most recent one, or the the last one he worked for, was the Disney Institute, uh, where he learned a lot about leadership. And he takes his message now to the uh, business world about leadership, and he talks a lot about leadership brilliance. He is one of America's top 10 most booked corporate and association speakers, and people love to hear him. He has a wonderful message, and he was wonderful to work with. And our ideas about leadership, he from the business sector and me from the education sector, we really aligned well, and we're excited to be able to share our, our leadership model with you. And let me tell you about Dr. Marcita Riley. Uh, she is probably one of the smartest people that I know. I've had the opportunity to work with her and to collaborate on this project. Uh, she's almost a 40-year educator uh, who lives uh, in Hoyt, Kansas, uh, on a 100-acre farm with her awesome husband, Larry. <laughs> and uh, she invited me out to the farm. I'm a city guy, so <laughs> city goes to country. Imagine the visual. <laughs> It was quite a character-building really moment. <laughs> yeah. It was a character-building moment. <laughs> I realized oh. I needed to leave the leather uh, clothes that I have at home and get ready to do some real work. But <laughs> That's right. <laughs> get in the mud. <laughs> I think I earned my meal that day when I worked on the farm. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so, but oh, no. That's really good. <laughs> we are really, really passionate about education and Marcita's extensive background in all different types of roles uh, as an educator really informed our thinking. And we really believe the framework that we are going to share with you today will help you as a leader to be brilliant every day in every way. That's right. Okay. We want to the the what we're, we're talking to you about today comes from our book releasing leadership brilliance and we're going to talk about creating a power a culture of empowered education we believe that leadership is an activity not a position and that everybody has a responsibility to contribute to the student's success um, and that's what we mean by empowered education it's about helping everyone know that they have a role and to uh, feel responsible for stepping up to help, um, help our students be as successful as they can be. So, We believe that the job of an educator is really difficult these days and it's, it's not easy. And we know that many organizations, they spend a lot of time um, doing off-site retreats and talking about they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And we believe educators have to recognize that culture eats strategy for lunch. And if you're going to have a culture that is really, really successful, 
knowing that you're facing, you know, little respect, low pay, uh, anybody can do it. We understand that, but we really want to come alongside you and, and help equip you with the mindset that's needed to build a culture that sustains results over time. Right. And as hard as it is to be a teacher, sometimes it's even harder to create, to retain great leaders. Um, not just good leaders, but really great leaders, and then we want to keep them in our schools. But it's really hard to do that. There's some really interesting research from the School Leadership Network, and um, they have said that 25,000 principals leave the position every year. It's called churn. And 50% of principals quit during or after their third year or by their third year. And the other uh, disappointing thing is that most often principals tra transfer to more affluent schools as soon as they get a chance. So just like in teaching, sometimes the step into um, leadership role is in a difficult school, and then you get that new person in there, and they really start going, and they start doing great things, but as soon as they see that there's an opening in a more affluent school, they leave. And that's a problem. That's the problem with churn. Because we know that leaders' effect on students contributes 25% of the total school influence on a, teacher, on a child's academic performance. So leaders make a difference on children's academic performance as well as teachers because principles influence school culture and instructional quality. <coughs> so as hard as it is to keep teachers, it's even harder to keep leaders in position of school educators. So we really want to look at how are we helping people show up as educators. And we, what we've created is a leadership model to empower education. And uh, we think that one of the things that a great leader does is inspire people. Well, we in our book try to inspire you with true stories of some of the, <coughs> excuse me, we interviewed over 30 or 40 award-winning principals from uh, breakthrough schools and uh, blue ribbon principals from NASSP and NAESP. And we took some of those stories and said, these are, the, these are people who are doing the hard work of transforming low-performing schools to high-performing. So you'll be, we hope you'll be inspired by the, by the stories that you read in our book. Also, we knew that you as readers want to know not just ideas, but you, how do I get started if I like this idea? So we have included tools and resources to really help you get started into this work of being an educational leader that empowers people. And finally, we believe that the, that the work of, of leadership is to create an empowered community. And by that we mean you help all the people within your community. That's not just the people within the school walls. It's not just the faculty and staff and students. It's also the parents, the community leaders, and businesses who feel confident about the quality of your school. And they feel competent because they know what their role is, how they can contribute, because you help them know what that is. And then they become courageous because they know that when they see kids in, in their neighborhood who aren't being successful, they talk about it. They help, they help that student, but they also come to the school and they don't just point fingers and say, well, so-and-so should do something else. They, they step up and say, let's work on this together. So that's what we mean by an empowered community. Part of the reason why we wrote this book is we were really passionate about giving educational leaders a framework 
to really understand that they have the ability to break sound barriers. And since the book is built on a flight metaphor, there are four forces of flight that we would like to share with you. The first force of flight is weight. And weight is thinking about your personal brilliance, the calling, the thing that you have been designated to do, and what's the weight of that, all right? The second force is the force of lift. And lift is how do we give a hand up and not just a hand out. The third force is this force called thrust, which allows an airplane to move forward. And that's really looking at team brilliance. So if lift is about collaborative brilliance, weight is about personal brilliance, thrust is about team brilliance, and how are you leveraging your team to drive results? But then finally, and probably the most important, is drag. And drag has to do with how do we remove all of the barriers and obstacles that prevent students from operating in their brilliance. And in your culture, in your school, how do you move from a school that is teacher-directed to student-centered? So these four forces of flight come together that allow you to break the sound barrier and create what Marcita and I would call the boom in your school that allows everyone to achieve and operate brilliantly. So something that we really, really are excited about, we put together a, uh, a framework or poster that goes a lot deeper because you've heard us mention culture uh, a number of times thus far. And what we decided to do is to give you a visual that really kind of encapsulates, here's what personal brilliance is, collaborative brilliance, team brilliance, student brilliance, and some specific things that you can think about as anchors as it relates to creating the culture that we believe should exist in all schools. So in personal brilliance, you'll see that be a leader with a vision, discover your purpose, lead with your strengths. In collaborative brilliance, go beyond the norm, listen loudly. In team brilliance, how do we move from me to we? How do we upgrade the skill and infuse the will for staff to really buy into where we're going? And then finally, student brilliance is how do we ensure that we give the voice to students, that they know that they've been heard, and create meaningful student engagement that allows them to produce and do what they need to do in order to graduate? All right. Thanks. That's a great overview, Simon, of our model. But it's been, that's been kind of a technical big, big overview. So we want to go deeply into each one of these little um, cornerstones. And we'll start with personal brilliance. And we're going to tell you the story of one of the principles that we interviewed. So as an example of weight, which is personal brilliance, um, we want to tell you or I want to tell you about Carol Spillane Conklin. She is a high school principal at Sleepy Hollow, New York. Now, um, Carol was, cho was a, a very good teacher, and she was selected to be principal of this Sleepy Hollow High School. And um, she really had strong views. She knew exactly what, what her beliefs were about what makes a great school. And it happened to be for her, it was about sharing leadership, personalizing learning for students, and the power of professional learning for the teachers. Now, when she uh, started the school, she began to realize that for the past 10 years, there hadn't been a principal who had lasted more than two years at the school. So there had been a parade of principals through the school for 10 years before her. And in that parade, there really was a leadership void because nothing could really get started, get going. And so in that void of administrative leadership, um, the union rules took over. Now, union rules are good for teachers, but sometimes as being the only leadership model that they have, it's not sometimes not, not uh, student-friendly. So she went in 
knowing who she was and what she stood for and knowing that there was a uh, it was a contradiction for that at, at the school. But she didn't go in and say, you know, slash and burn and let, let's do all this change. Instead, she just kind of looked, watched, and listened. And as the, as the first couple of faculty meetings, <coughs> she looked at where were, the, where were the power people, where were the influencers, the informal and the formal influencers at the school? Who were the people who seemed most ready and interested in making some changes and being more student-centered? And um, uh, how, how could she, what are the ways, who were the union people that were important to include in conversations? Now, the negotiated uh, contract said that there could be one hour of faculty meeting each month and one hour of departmental meeting each month. Now, what Carol wanted was professional learning because she could see that there were good teachers on the staff and she wanted to bring in some of the best practices to the staff and get them involved in looking at, at implementing some of these best practices. So she negotiated informally, but she, at her school, she informally negotiated, we'll just let me have an hour and a half faculty meeting every month, and then we'd, I don't have to be involved at all in departmental meetings. So if departments want to uh, have questions for me or want me to be involved with something, I'll be glad to do extra time before or after school. All I need is an hour and a half each month. And then when she had her first faculty meeting, she began, she put them in different seating patterns so that the naysayers, the ones who were sort of resistant to um, having a principal at the school, um, they were all at one table. Now, usually we try to disperse the naysayers but she, she was very astute in that she put them all at one table so that when they talked about, uh, in large group, they talked about their ideas and perspectives, that perspective was definitely present, but it, wasn't, it didn't dampen the discussion and the in, uh, innovation, innovative thinking that might pop up in the other, in the other groups. In these um, faculty meetings also, Carol modeled good teaching ideas. Um, and she listened to teachers' insight, and she encouraged teachers to try out new ideas. She worked with the volunteers. She worked with the ones who were really interested in trying new things, and she didn't worry so much about the ones who were sort of resistant or, or staying back. Um, and then as these people who were experimenting and trying out things were having good results, she brought them, she showcased them at the faculty meetings and had them tell the faculty about the thing, the success that they were having. And she also said to them, don't just tell them the successes, tell them how you adapted when things didn't work and, and the, the, uh, how you were smart about making things really relevant for your kids. So she did that and she began to grow this teacher um, risk-taking and interest in really bringing the best practices to the classrooms. It became a grassroots effort to develop teachers. It, she called it the show me, follow me model. So, so she would introduce an idea to a teacher if the teacher was interested in trying it out. She'd encourage them and give them uh, a way to t talk about it with, with their colleagues and encourage other people then to follow these informal leaders rather than it being her idea that was dragging people along. So she was really modeling how she wanted teachers to build relationships with students. So Carol was very successful at this and over the period of about two or three years, she really began to make a difference in the culture at her school. She built professionalism of staff, and she worked with, she, and she continued to work with the union. She wasn't resistant to them. She respected what they, the, the uh, leadership that they brought, but she really got 
the professional culture that she wanted at the school. And in 2014, she be, she was um, named a breakthrough school for NASSP. You want to add anything to that, Simon? You know, I really love the spunk and the fire and the passion that she shared with us during the interview. And yeah. it's not surprising that she's been elevated to take some of the success that she's had and to spread that throughout the district. So really, uh, right. really excited about Carol's Carol's trajectory. Right. She became a she. This is actually uh, this past year was her first year as superintendent. <laughs> so. That and we really... know, yeah, we know that she'll be extremely effective. And she was at that school for, um, I think, 12 or 15 years. So mm -hmm. she's mm -hmm. done a really good job. All right. And our next one is about Lyft. Yeah, Todd is a principal in Texas, and we had a chance to interview him at the NAESP annual meeting, and he shared with us some profound insights on taking his school to the community. Um, oftentimes, teachers may hear about poverty, they've read about poverty, but it's another thing to experience poverty. So they decided to go to an apartment complex not far from their school where many of their students lived on a Saturday morning, and he told his staff to specifically dress in flip-flops, shorts, T-shirts, uh, to really blend into the community, and they decided to do a barbecue. They decided to barbecue hot dogs and hamburgers, and all of a sudden, parents started kind of pouring out into the, the main area of the apartment complex to say, okay, what are you doing here? Are you trying to tell us we need to read at least 20 minutes a day to our, our children? And he says, no, we're just here because we care about you and we want to let you know that. And if you can imagine, all of a sudden students see their teachers in the parking lot, so they would invite the teachers to come into their living quarters. And teachers would have an epiphany when they noticed that a two-bedroom apartment actually housed seven adults. And they were a lot more empathetic to understand perhaps why that student was not able to get their homework done because of their living condition. And they could design specific tools and workarounds knowing now what that student is dealing with. But Todd and his team, they didn't stop there. This was just not a one-off. They decided to do an event called Celebrate the Gentlemen of the Community because Donuts with Dad was not working and they didn't have the involvements of dads as much as they would like. And they were only projecting to have about 125 men attend the event. They ended up having over 600 men. It caused them to have to partner with the VFW, the uh, district office, and many community-based organizations to really ensure that this event was successful. And what they realized is so many times men are beat up for what they're not doing, for their lack of involvement in the school. And one father who attended the event was so moved by the event, the next day went to his employer and requested specific time to be off so that he could volunteer at the school. And eventually he became uh, an adopted dad of the school because <laughs> of this and, and really sent a bigger message to all the other men in the school that they could get involved. But Todd didn't stop there. Now, remember, we're talking about lift. So lift is a hand up, not just a hand out. So he decided to do vision casting with the local community partners and businesses to say, we are trying to build. Uh, we've ran out of the funding that we needed to do some things. So we are going to vision cast and we're going to do some friend raising that hopes leads to fundraising. And of course, when businesses hear that schools you know, want to do fundraising, you know, the first thing they want to shut down because they're thinking that the school is going to show up with their hat in their hand. And Todd said, listen, we don't know what you are able to do, but let's share with you what we're trying to accomplish. And as he began to share that, here's, you know, we're building a classroom, we need X. 
a furniture company decided to say, hey, we can donate furniture. And then it went on and on from there because sometimes it's not hard dollars that were needed. Sometimes they just needed a partner, a partner who had the resource that they could provide. And, and I think what was so interesting, as Todd was sharing with Marcita and myself, is this ability to engage the community in what they're really tr trying to do and trying to accomplish and, and do it in a respectful way. Marcita, any other That's thoughts? That's right. They just, um, it, it's exciting. Uh, Todd is very exciting to listen to, and he, he tells stories after stories of how he connects with the community. And, he t and it is so important for his students because many of his students, I think he said 90% of his students are, are uh, considered poverty students or poverty level. And many of them don't have um, stable homes. A lot, of the, a lot of the men in their lives aren't necessarily their biological fathers. But it is, he really wanted to encourage the neighborhood uh, Men, the uncles, the the uh, the big brothers, um, those kinds of people, and and helped them know what what difference it made in their lives, and uh, it really made a difference in the way that the community stepped up for the children. So he is an excellent story about how a community can lift up kids who don't have the resources of of uh, middle class or affluent districts. Great story. Um, so now I want to talk about thrust. And thrust, if you remember, in our um, aerospace model, is the engine of, of our leadership model. And this is about team brilliance. So um, Robbie Hooker is a really good example of this. He comes from Clark County, Georgia, and he is principal at the Clark County High School. 75% of his school is on free and reduced lunches. And he was getting really discouraged. He'd been principal at the school for several years, and he'd been really discouraged because his students weren't performing, they weren't achieving as he wanted them to. But uh, there was a new superintendent hired for the district, and this superintendent came in, and on the first day he said, we will no longer accept poverty as the reason for students to fail. And Robbie heard that message, and he said, That's, that is the message I want to take to my staff. And so when school started the next fall, he had uh, the faculty, he said to the faculty, remember, we are not going to let poverty be the reason our students fail. So he had them do a whole school book study of the Breaking Ranks 2 book. And that's, a, that's the research behind the breaking, Breakthrough Schools movement. And after they finished reading that story or, the, or that book, he said, okay, so what is it that from this that we can learn and what is it that we want to implement first? What's really, what are the important steps? And the faculty said, well, we think we need to change the master schedule because we're not really paying attention. We're not able to meet together to really look at student results together. We're not able to meet as departments to really see how kids are doing. So that's what they did for the school year. They changed the master schedule so that um, departments and, and uh, teachers who were teaching the same kinds of skills and um, content could, be to, could have time together, planning time together, to really look at are the kids learning what we want them to learn? And where are the problem pieces in, in uh, the, the vertical learning that we have in our curriculum? So that was the, and and you'll notice that uh, Robbie didn't go in and read the book himself, and he didn't say, "Okay, this is what I think we should do." He just asked the question of his faculty. 
So what is it that you think is the most important thing for us to do? So once the master schedule got changed, he said, okay, so what's the next thing we need to look at? And once again, the teachers stepped up and they said, you know, one of the, we have a lot of special ed kids in our school and they're in, a, they're in pull out classes and, and they're, we're really not challenging them enough. And so they took on getting more of the special ed students into mainstream classes were appropriate. So they did a lot more of that and that became a successful strategy. So that special ed kids had greater rigor and uh, uh, responsibility in their learning. And then he went to the, they, they had good uh, honors and uh, advanced uh, placement classroom teachers, but they were only teaching AP and honors courses. And he said, you know, you all teach wonderful classes and you have really interesting ways to engage the kids. And I want that to be part of the experience of more kids. So I want to assign at least half of your classes to be regular ed kids. And we're going to, and more of our teachers are going to learn. I'm going to send them to training to learn these AP and honors, um, uh, uh, instructional practices so that more teachers are, are using those kinds of instructional practices with all of our children. So the, the teachers began to really embrace that and now they're very proud of the fact that they teach so that so many of the teachers consider themselves AP and honor students no matter who is sitting in the chairs in front of them. Um, and one last thing he did was to bring in the parents because he knew this is a different idea for his parents because he wanted more of the kids to be taking AP and honors classes. So he started having parent groups and parent conversations um, about encouraging their children to take AP and honors courses and saying to them, just because you're poor doesn't mean that your child isn't capable. And we believe your child is capable of, of, of uh, more uh, substantive learning. And that's what we want to give them. So once again, um, his school, after several years, made great strides in, at student achievement. And in 2013, he became, or he was announced as a breakthrough school, something he was very proud of. And you know the great thing about Robbie is is the ability to engage all of the teachers, all of the departments, all of the teams around really focusing on the student and thinking about how they do what they do in a better and, and fresh way. That's exactly right. So he really focused those teams on student learning. Mm -hmm. Now, you tell us about how to reduce drag, because Judy Marty is a great example of that. <laughs> Judy we is her, amazing. We? Yeah, we yeah. love Judy. Judy is in Hylia Gardens, Florida, and her school district uh, serves students that English is not their first language. Uh, it's also a community that has about 80% uh, poverty level. And, but she would not let those factors prevent students from being all that they can be. So literally, when you come into her school, there is an alum wall that shows all of the students that have graduated from the school and where did they go to college. Because she wanted to send two messages. Number one, to parents, if your students come here, they will graduate and they will go on to college. But also, number two, she wanted to shape the thinking of the teachers who would not see the students through the lens of poverty and where they've come from, but to begin to see them through the lens of possibility. So everything that she did was to raise the awareness of it's possible. Uh, as you can imagine, there are many temptations that happen outside of the school. So their school opens very, very early in the morning and closes very late in the evening just to keep students engaged and to know that they have a safe place 
uh, to come. And the the other interesting thing is they they ran into uh, a challenge with the state of Florida that did not believe that they had achieved the test scores, the state test scores that they achieved, because they saw them through the lens of poverty. And they came and did a very extensive investigation to really understand if the scores that the, the children had achieved, if they were true. And in the end, the school was exonerated and nothing was held against them. And true enough, it was true that these students had succeeded. But what Judy did is she removed all of the barriers, anything that would prevent students from not achieving. Also during the summer, um, they have summer hours where students can come, read, learn, continue to grow, continue to develop themselves because she is just a force to be reckoned with. And she has infused all of her teachers to say, how can we ensure that every student succeeds in our school and graduates? That's exactly right. You know, um, the amazing thing is that 97% of her students graduate on time and 92% of them go to a college or some kind of post-secondary school. She really challenged and broke down those self-limiting beliefs by celebrating student success everywhere she can. Um, and she challenges students to take um, honors and advanced placement courses and dual credit courses and some of her students graduate and they already have enough hours to get an associate degree because of dual credit. So she is really not only um, offering high level um, instruction, she's challenging the students, lots of them, I, in fact I think it's 95% uh, of the eighth graders take the ninth grade end of course algebra test in Florida. So she's challenging them to take those tests early. And if they don't if they don't pass it, at least they know what they need to know during this year in order to pass it. So it's it's like if you don't pass it it's not a failure. It just gives you more information. And um and of course they're taking it a whole year ahead. So she is really uh, a cheerleader, and she has um, uh, really set fire under her her faculty as well. It's a great story. Um, you know what? Uh, in our work with Corwin, of course, we we have uh, talked extensively with Russ Qualia, and he has done wonderful research about. The, the benefits of, of student voice. And the most compelling thing for us was this quote or this, this particular research piece. When students think they can be successful and believe the teacher thinks they can be successful, they are eight times more likely to be motivated to learn than students who don't have those beliefs. And so often I think um, our students don't see us don't see us being cheerleaders for them, and I guess I would say that Judy Marty is is uh, the ultimate cheerleader for the students in her school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we put together was uh, many tools. So as Marcita already shared with you, we have a number of case studies, and we also have twelve tools in the book and one of the tools is this whole thing that we call looking at your team from an asset standpoint instead of a liability. So step one is to think about yourself and your team. List their names or their initials below and then in step two, list the unique or intangible asset, that knowledge, that skill, that talent that they bring to the table. And then step three is as a leader, as a principal, as an educator, how do you intend to leverage that asset, that thing, or what we call brilliance, that they bring to the table so that they can make a significant impact on students? And we believe that understanding how individuals are wired and looking at them through the lens of what they're doing right 
instead of what they're doing wrong, that this tool allows you to do that in a very simplistic way. Right. And when we have uh, presented this to school teams and groups, educational groups, they really love it because um, in my work with, with teacher groups, so often there's complaints about uh, teams aren't working well together because of personality conflicts among the members. And we get the adults in the, in the team get kind of stuck on, on if, so, if only so-and-so would do such and such, if only if somebody, somebody would change. But they don't take, uh, they don't look at the, uh, the person as having some strengths. They don't look for the strengths. They get caught up in what, what they would consider deficits. So this tool really forces you to think about what are the strengths of each person on the team and it helps you reframe and when you in your head, it's your mindset, when your mindset reframes that person instead of being a deficit person, they're actually an asset person, it changes how you show up, how you think about them and how you relate to them. And then suddenly they become... Uh, much more invested in the team itself and the team functions better. Uh, people that we've used this with have really loved it because it's a great way to re reframe, if, particularly if there's some personality issues among team members. Are there personality issues on a team? Seriously? Ah. Really? <laughs> Didn't know. <laughs> Didn't know. That's right. And that's <laughs> not just for <laughs> educators either. <laughs> so here, um, our second tool that we want to show you is what we call Upgrade the Skill and Infuse the Will. And it comes, uh, it comes from Max Landsberg, who is uh, from the business world. Um, actually, uh, Simon is the one that introduced me to this tool. And it's a really great tool. Um, it's essentially four quadrants, and you're looking at your staff uh, along the uh, along the horizontal. At how skillful are they in really knowing how to do the change that you want them to make? And on the horizontal, it's how willing are they and how interested are they in making changes? So this this little. Um, tool helps you know what kinds of conversations to have with people who are in the different quadrants so that they're, you're building relationship with them rather than having them be defensive about conversations with you as, a, as an educational leader. So for example, you've got um, the person who has low skill, they're, they're, not, you know, they're not really skilled in the, in the new a change, and they're not particularly interested in making a change. These might be your teachers who are the the nine to three teachers. They're just there uh, to have a job, and so you want to be direct with them. But you want to get to know them personally. So it's about what do you like? What do you? What, what I want to know you, you. You build rapport with them first. Then you ask them about what they want. What, what vision do they have for the students who, who do well in their class? You help them get clear about some, some goals. You might consider them easy goals, but help them set some goals that they can see in their students. And then give them feedback, even when they make little steps forward. So that's a way to get them moving in the right direction. In the... In the um, upper left quadrant, you have um, low skill teachers but high will. And those might be your brand new teachers. Um, they may not be very skillful in a particular instructional strategy, but they really want to make an impact on students. So once again, you want to give them low, you want to su suggest low risk opportunities for them to practice this particular skill. You send them to training you, and you give them coaching and feedback. Usually they really just suck that up. They love it because they're, they're really wanting to, do, to know more. 
and you you relax your judgment and control so that you don't expect perfection from them, but you let them know, once again, with your feedback, every time they make a step forward and every all the things that they're doing good, and then help them know what they have to continue to build on. Over on the on the right side, you have the teachers who are, um, th these are probably, they're high skill teachers. They're really good in their content. They're often really good in, in student management, but they're not particularly interested in making changes. And um, these, are, these are our career teachers. These are teachers who we really want to connect with. So the way to get to know them is to, ex is to try to excite them in what the possibility is when they really connect with students. You want to help them know what motivates them. Why do they continue to do this job? What, what really, why did they get into it in the first place? What are their values? What do they want for their students? and help them to connect to their why for staying in the field. And uh, give them the respect that you show them, tell them what you, what you are, um, what you see as their strengths and why you appreciate their being on the team. And then you give them recognition um, at faculty meetings. You ask them to um, be involved in some things at school so that they know that you respect them and, and, and you do believe that they are good teachers and they'll be kind of begin to step into um, greater movement into some changes if they see uh, that there's a good reason for it and that it and that they can be uh, recognized as part of the, um, the leadership for it. And we really and, like this model, don't we? Yes, we, really we like do. We love this model. It it really helps you um, uh, know how to talk to and what kinds of conversations to have with different uh, with teachers at different developmental levels on your staff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we share this particular tool at T Case, um, yes. Texas. Uh, uh, it was just a great group of it's special council, education yeah, teachers. The Texas, yeah, Texas Council, council of special a school school administrator. No, school special school. ed administrators. Yeah, that yes. was it. <laughs> and they really, really enjoy this tool, and we've gotten great feedback from it. We have gotten great feedback from it. So here's some takeaways from Powered Education. Um, these are the things we hope you take away from this particular webinar. One is that. Empowered education is about building the confidence of staff, students, and community in your educational program. And you do that by knowing yourself well, what your values and beliefs are, that's your personal brilliance, and helping everybody else talk about what they care about in education and how your school is, is, um, is trying to provide that for the, for the students in your in your community. Um, we hope that uh, our um, model helps develop confidence in, competence in and respect for staff and students. That's one of the keys to building trust and rapport. It's not about seeing the definite deficits in people, it's about finding the strengths in people and letting them know that you appreciate those strengths. And then finally, we believe that when people are empowered by their education, they have courage to break barriers. When they see something that's a problem, they speak up. They don't just have parking lot conversations about it and blame others. They say, you know, I'm not sure. I think this may be a problem. How can we work on it? And they bring it out into the open and want to participate in solution finding instead of um, problem nagging. <laughs> and, and let's talk about this. Yeah, the implementation plan we think is probably the most important thing you can do beyond today's webinar. We really hope that you will look at book study groups and, and, and workshops. We can easily come in and do a workshop to really build the skill 
as it relates to releasing leadership brilliance. Uh, there's an opportunity for coaching to practice and get feedback. And certainly uh, during your in-service days, we are more than happy to come and provide keynotes to really inspire action so that you have sustainability along this whole continuum of releasing leadership brilliance. Right. It's not. We didn't write the book just to share our ideas. We really are passionate, both of us, in trying to change the way leaders show up for their leadership work. Because we believe everything rises and falls on the shoulders of leaders. And all of you who are listening to us, you are leaders, and we believe in your brilliance. Absolutely. So, Nicole, while we've been talking, have there been some questions that have popped up? Yes, I have a couple questions for both of you. So I will ask the first one, and then I'll give you time for, to, for both of you to be able to share your response. The first question is, are there opportunities to get involved in a community or some you know, way, either online or through a book study, any recommendations you have, um, to get involved in a, in a way that we can focus on this information about educational leadership? Well, uh, I'd say uh, we're really trying to, uh, we want to uh, start a community. Uh, we absolutely want to do that. You want to talk about that some more? Yeah, I was going to say you can go to releasingleadershipbrilliance.com mm -hmm. and engage with our online community. There are a number of resources there. And also we have been using the hashtag Breaking Barriers Together. It's Break Barriers Break, together, break so Barriers, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Break Barriers mm -hmm. Together that allows you to see some of the feedback that we're receiving from other educators around the country, what's resonating with them as they read the book. That's right. We we uh, agree that it's really it's hard to do this work, and we want the people who are doing this work to feel like that they have a community um, uh, to help them get started and to help them keep going. Uh, Robbie Hooker particularly talked about how that was really important for him. So great. Yes. Good. Great to hear that. Okay. To, next question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Mar uh, Marcia, did you want to repeat that web address? Yes, it's uh, releasingleadershipbrilliance.com. Great. And the hashtag is break uh, sound barriers. Yes. No, okay. break great. barriers together. <laughs> break barriers together. Got it. And we That's will correct. have that. We'll share that out um, on, at the end of this webinar again. Okay, okay second good. question is, you mentioned the schools and leaders you've worked with. Do you conduct on-site or job-embedded work? Mm, absolutely. Um, we, because, you know, this is stuff, this, is, of course, our culture changes, and so culture changes take time. Um, and so we love to work with groups, with school districts, with schools, with associations, <clears throat> to help them implement some of these ideas and get them started. The thing about this kind of a change process is that it's there's no recipe. You decide where it is that your the energy is greatest with your team and that's where you start. So we've got four cornerstones. We could start with any one of them and help you help you uh, you know bring about the change you want by um, just Putting the pieces, helping you put the pieces together, and think about how to lead your school. Great. Good. Okay. Next question. There's two more. Do you feel that this model can translate to the classroom with teachers and students? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Remember, we said leadership is an activity, not a position, and so. We would hope that teachers would, and teacher leaders and instructional coaches would use these same cornerstones uh, in their work with students and in their work with colleagues. Um, uh, it's yeah. about taking responsibility for that's the empowerment. Taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you see something that wants that you want to change, it's not about pointing to somebody else to do it. It's like saying. How can I get this started? 
how can I see if there's other people who believe like I do and want to make some changes? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm, I love that. Yeah, and I love the way that you mention um, how or, you know, really reinforce how teachers are leaders in the classroom and that that trans, transcends, um, you know, right down to the classroom level. That's fantastic. Um, okay, last question. Uh, and this is, a, this is a good one, and I think this actually leads into your next slide where you're going to share your contact information. But um, someone has asked if um, both and either of you are available to do keynotes. So that kind of goes along with the question about consenting, uh, conducting on-site work, but you must have some people that are interested in keynotes. Mm. Uh, listen, I know a really great <laughs> keynote speaker. Her name, is, her name is Marcita Riley. She's absolutely awesome. Take notes. She's phenomenal. I'm just saying. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know this. Sorry, <laughs> one of the <laughs> most <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it starts with, um, in, in all of these stories we told you, it starts with the leader speaking from the heart, the leader of the school, speaking from the heart about the changes they want or the vision that they have. And, and, and often then you can get some people uh, uh, with, some inspiration, with some inspirational ideas or are speaking, you can get other people interested. Um, so, yes, that we could, we'd love to do that, and here's some contact information for us. Again, just using our book title, our first name, and then just releasingleadershipbrilliance.com. Great, how you thank you. Get hold of us. So, um, Nicole, we're going to turn it over to you. How can they get the book if they don't already Great. have it? Well, yeah, perfect. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the inspiration today, Simon and Marcita. No doubt the information shared has the opportunity to break barriers in schools and districts across the country. I especially appreciated the examples you shared. Um, and so for those of you that are listening today, you can read more examples like the ones that Simon and Marcita described and learn how to embrace a model of brilliance uh, in their new book, Releasing Leadership Brilliance, which you see here on the screen, um, we're offering 20% off the title for your attendance today using the code E17560. And that offer has actually been extended through August of 2017. So for those of you that are listening at a later time, um, please check out Releasing Leadership Brilliance at Corwin.com and use E17560 as the discount code to receive 20% off. I also encourage you to visit corwin.com forward slash webinars to view the archives of all of our past webinars from our brilliant leaders um, that have given us an opportunity to hear inside of their work through our webinar presentations. Thank you again for spending your time with us. Marcita and Simon, again, very much appreciate you coming through the airways, um, breaking barriers. Uh, with us at Corwin and educators across the country. And I just wish you all a brilliant day. Thanks. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank we you. We loved for having it. You. Thanks. It's awesome.